Hello and welcome to the New City Church podcast. I'm Benjamin Komanopoli Jr., pastor of New City Church Hyderabad. This is where you will hear messages preached at our church. It's my prayer that the incorruptible seed of God's Word will strengthen you, build you, and help you receive the abundant life that Jesus came to give you. Enjoy the Word and be blessed. All right, today what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back uh, to uh, the series that we're on and the, the series that we're dealing with and where I'm talking to you about the Holy Spirit. Everyone say the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. How many of you are learning more about the Holy Spirit? Praise God. All right. Now remember that this is the year of knowing God. This is the year of knowing God. So if this is the year of knowing God, you cannot neglect the person of the Holy Spirit and say that you have an intimate relationship with God or that you know God. So in, in, in the process of knowing God, it is very important that we understand who the Father is, who the Son is, and who the Holy Spirit is as well. We've already established the fact that Jesus himself said that it was more beneficial that he leaves his disciples and goes back to the Father. Now that was a very shocking statement for them to hear. However, he says, if I do not go, then the Holy Spirit will not come. But if I do go to my Father, then you will be filled or baptized with the Holy Spirit. Everyone say Holy Spirit. So we understand that, see, for example, when you think about the entirety of the Bible, you see that everything started in the Garden of Eden. When it started in the Garden of Eden, we, we see God the Father creating. Well, the, the triune God created Ad, uh, Adam, and, and out of Adam comes Eve. And so there is this ongoing relationship that God has with man. However, once that relationship is lost, we see that for the uh, foreseeable uh, couple of uh, 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 centuries, what we see is primarily man having a relationship with God the Father. Now, I'm not saying that Jesus is not there. Uh, Jesus is definitely there throughout the Old Testament. The work of the Holy Spirit is also there throughout the Old Testament. But primarily what you uh, focus on or what is emphasized is the person and the work of God the Father. Now then you come into the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and now you see the introduction of the person of Jesus. Everyone say Jesus. All right. Now, once you hear uh, 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 people start hearing about Jesus, talking about Jesus, seeing the wonderful works that Jesus uh, uh, does. Now, from that place, we go to the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus. So we come to the point of salvation. Now, once you come to the point of salvation, that's not the end of the story for us. What happens is Jesus says, now that you are saved, I'm going to leave you with somebody. And that somebody is the person of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, one of the limitations for Jesus as well is that he was in an earthly body when he came. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. So everywhere he goes, the ministry would take place. Everywhere he goes, the miracles takes place. Everywhere he goes, signs, wonders, miracles follow the preaching of the word. However, now what happens is, now see, remember, that everything is a restoration of what was lost. What was lost is the relationship that God had with man. Now, how do you go further? How do you make it even better than what Adam had with the garden? The way you make it better than what even uh, Adam and Eve had with the garden is now with the introduction of the Holy Spirit, now that you become a new creation, you have the capacity to not just have God with you, but God in you. Everyone say God in you. Now say God in me. Amen. Now, so what happens is now the Holy Spirit moves on the inside of you. He resides on the inside of you. So now you are baptized. You are filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, what we see is every time that people were filled or baptized with the Holy Spirit, the immediate thing that happened was they began to speak with other tongues. All right. So uh, the first session or the first Sunday, I talked to you about uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The next time we started talking about, uh, uh, you know, praying in tongues or speaking in tongues. And I started introducing that. So today why, what I want to do is I want to take the time to talk to you about why speak in tongues. Why speak in tongues? Okay. Now, some of you understand the, the fact or the phenomenon called speaking in tongues. But why do we have to do that? Is that really necessary? And I think I laid a foundation last time I was here. And I said, uh, it is not that it is ne when you say, do I really need to do it or do is it really necessary for me? Well, the you know, depends on what your goal is. 
right? Depends on what your goal is. If a child comes to the mother and say, do I really need to go to school? Well, you don't have to go to school. You can live without going to school. It's not like if you don't go to school, you'll die. It's not that you will die, but the quality of your life will tremendously be impacted by whether or not you go to school. Does that make sense? Right? You go to school, you get a good education, then your quality of life increases. Your quality of life gets better. However, if you don't go to school, it does not mean you will die or it does not mean you cannot live. However, it means the quality of the life that you live will diminish. Are you understanding that? So in the same way, do I have to speak in tongues? No, you don't have to speak in tongues. It's not a question of, you know, do I have to do this? The, the way, right way to think about it is that you get to do it. Right? Just like you get to go to school. It's a privilege for every child where the parents actually send them to school. It's a privilege. They might feel like it's a punishment from time to time. They might want to stay back, but later on they will understand it's actually a privilege. I thank God that my mom and dad uh, uh, paid the fees, uh, woke up in the morning, got me dressed, dropped me off in school or get me on the bus, get me in the auto, did what they did. Why? Now today I am an educated person. I can read and I can write and I can speak with other people. Amen. So it's the same thing with speaking in tongues. You don't have to do it to go to heaven. You will perfectly enter into heaven without ever speaking in tongues while you live on this earth. However, what I'm trying to tell you is if you are a person that says, you know what? I want everything that God has for me. I want to receive the best that God has for me. I want to accomplish every single thing that God has destined for my life. I want to accomplish the goals the, 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 and reach the destiny that God has for me. If that is who you are, then I would say yes. Then yes. If that's the goal, if that's the kind of life you want to live, yes. Then, that, then uh, speaking in tongues is a very important and vital part of your life. If you understand that, say amen. All right, so the first reason that we talked about, and by the way, listen, the, <laughs> living the Christian life without the Holy Spirit, that's just a crazy thing to do. The Christian life is not a hard life. The Christian life is an impossible life. It's an impossible life. You cannot live the Christian life with your own strength and ability. So to, to say, okay, I'm going to live the Christian life without the help of the Holy Spirit, without the indwelling presence, without receiving strength from the Holy Spirit, without receiving wisdom from the Holy Spirit, that, that's just a recipe for disaster. That's just a recipe for frustration in your life. Remember, your Christian life should not be a frustration. It must be a joy. Everyone say joy. Amen. So that's what we, uh, that, that's what I want us to uh, uh, understand and realize. Also, one other thing is when you hear people talk uh, um, or um, use the phrase, the gift of tongues, I want you to understand that there is a distinction uh, in how certain people use it. Okay. So for example, in the English language, if you think of a, a word like cool or cold, right? Cool normally it, it, it is describing temperature, am I right? But if you say, that guy is really cool, you're not describing his temperature, right? Or if you say, that guy is very cold, you're not describing, unless you're talking about a dead body, right? Then it might be cold. But if it's not, then you're not talking about a the temperature of the person. If you say that man is very cold, that means what? He's, he, he's, he, he's not uh, uh, a welcoming. He, he's uh, to himself, he does not greet people warmly. That's what you're describing. You're not describing a temperature, but you're using the exact same word. Am I right? If, if you say, uh, um, you know, I, I saw the father teach his uh, son how to hold a bat. Now, how many of you are assuming uh, that, that he's teaching his son how to hold one wing on, with the left hand and the other wing with the right hand? How many of you are assuming that? None of you. So you immediately know he's not talking about holding an, uh, the animal bat, right? Called bat. You're, you quickly understand that he's talking about the cricket bat or baseball bat. Right? You're talking about a sport. You're not talking about an animal. Now, how do you distinct, uh, how do you make that distinction? How do you know the difference? It's by the context in which the same word is being used. If you understand that, say amen. All right. So even when it comes to the gift of tongues, certain times based on the context, and sometimes it may be misused, but what you must understand is, yes, primarily 
even the, the ability given to every believer to speak with other tongues is also the gift of tongues. Why? Because we do not earn it, but it is a gift of God, just like you can say the gift of salvation. However, there is also, when the Bible talks about the gift of tongues specifically, what the Bible is talking about is not just you speaking in an unknown language, but you speaking in a known language that you do not know. Are you understanding the difference? Now, what is an unknown language? An unknown language is, not, is a language that is not known by any human. Are you getting that? See, if it's an unknown language, you may not know it, but somebody in that country, in that tribe, in that state knows that language, so it's not an unknown language. It's only an unknown language when nobody knows that language. Are you getting that? However, now, when I was in Japan, while I was preaching or while I was praying, if I start speaking and they hear clear Japanese, that's the gift of tongues where I do not know how to speak Japanese. However, when by the help of the Holy Spirit, by the gift of the Holy Spirit, I begin to speak Japanese even though I never learned Japanese. Are you understanding that? So there's two different distinctions. And one of the things that happens is when you think both of those things are the same, you begin to think that the gift of tongues is only for a few people. And the gift of tongues is not just for a few people. So one of the ways you can make a proper distinction is the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for every believer. Are you understanding that? The baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, when we say the baptism of the Holy Spirit, what do we mean? What we mean is the ability to open your mouth and speak with other tongues. The ability for you to open your mouth and speak with other tongues. This is the reason why Jesus told the disciples, do not do not a single thing until you are baptized with the Holy Spirit, until you are anointed, until you are filled with the Holy Spirit, and then you begin to go and do the works. Now, when even the Apostle Paul, when he says, I pray in other tongues, or I speak in tongues more than all of you, or more than all of you combined, what is he talking about? He is talking about this particular aspect of where he opens his mouth and begins to pray or begins to speak with an unknown language, begins to speak with other tongues. Why is it unknown language? Because at that time, you are speaking to, not to man, but to God. Everyone say, but to God. All right, okay. Now with that foundation, let's quickly go. The first reason why you must speak in tongues is for personal edification. Personal edification. First Corinthians chapter 14, verses two through four and verse four in, in the New King James says, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. That means he builds himself up. That means you're strengthening yourself. So now let's look at the opposite. That means a person who is not speaking in a tongue is not building himself up. Am I right? So if, if you are building yourself up by speaking in tongues, what happens by not speaking in tongues? You're not building yourself up. So automatically, the man or the woman who speaks with other tongues is going to be a more strengthened man or a woman. That means they'll be able to take care of certain things that the person that does not pray in the spirit or does not speak with other tongues cannot take care of. If you understand that, say amen. All right. In the New Living Translation, the Bible says, a person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally. Everyone say personally. So the way you can think about it is like you working out, you going to the gym. When you work out, who's strengthened? You're strengthened, right? When you work out, you're strengthened. When somebody else works out, they are strengthened. You cannot work out for somebody else. Right? So in the same way, you are personally strengthened when you pray in the Holy Spirit. Now, right, the second reason why. The second reason why you, you must pray in the Spirit or speak with other tongues is to overcome temptation. To overcome temptation. How many of you deal with temptations in your life? Some of you don't? Come on, everyone that has a pulse should have their hands lifted up. Why? Because every one of us deal with Temptation. Now, just because you are tempted does not mean you have sinned. Even Jesus was tempted of the devil. That does not mean he sinned. He was faultless and he never sinned. Now, why is this important for us to be able to overcome temptation? Because you are strengthened. Everyone say strengthened. See, just like when you are healthy in your body, when, when other people get sick, you will not necessarily get sick. Why? Because of the immunity that is in the body. 
So also with the spirit, when you are prayed up, when you've built yourself up by speaking in tongues, you have built yourself up to such a place where even when temptation comes into your life, you can overcome that temptation. Now, every person that is here, you, when you are dealing with temptation in your life, you're going, it feels like you're going around in circles. Okay, you, you, uh, you feel like you've uh, uh, gotten over it, and, but then a couple of days later, you fall into the same thing. Gotten over it, a couple of weeks later, you fall into the same thing. Gotten over it, a few months later, you've fallen into the same thing. Same habit, same old repetition. I want you to understand, one of the ways you will overcome that temptation, the, one of the ways you will see victory in that area is by praying in the Holy Spirit is by speaking with other tongues. Everyone say hallelujah. hallelujah. Right, you must speak with other tongues. Why? You will encourage yourself. You will build yourself up. You will be strengthened. Jude chapter 1 and verse 20 says, But you, beloved, build yourselves up, founded on the most holy faith. Look at what it says. Make progress, rise like an edifice, higher and higher. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, every time the Bible says praying in the Spirit or praying in the Holy Spirit, he's talking about praying in tongues. Praying in tongues. So understand this. Next time you're tempted to do something that you know you're not supposed to do. Now, it can be something as, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, something like just keeping up your goals, keeping up your boundaries, or to certain things that the Bible explicitly tells you not to do. Uh, the Bible explicitly says that this is sin. You should not watch this. You should not go there. You should not hang out with these people. These kinds of words should not come out of your mouth. All of those things that the Bible is explicitly talking about. Every single time you're tempted. And even before you're tempted, I want to encourage every single one of you to start praying in the spirit. Start speaking with other tongues and you will begin to see the supernatural power of God that will help you overcome temptation in your life. Now, let me also say this. Do you know even feeling sad can be a temptation? Feeling depressed can be a temptation? Right? Some, some people uh, uh, have gotten so used to feeling sad, they like going back and listening to those old songs. They like going back and listening to those sad songs. They like, and, and as soon as you listen, you go back into that frame of mind. As soon as that melody hits your ears, you're there. And you, and you, and, and this, this attitude of, oh, woe is me. Nobody cares for me. Nobody thinks about me. Nobody loves me. Oh, see, Understand that. That's, that's a temptation. That's a temptation. That's a temptation for some of you. Some of you, worry is a temptation. The next time you are tempted to worry about something, open your mouth and begin to pray in other tongues. Open your mouth and begin to... Why? Because when you begin to pray in other tongues, so far what we've seen is we build ourselves up. That's why here in Jude he says, build yourself higher and higher and higher. And the higher you go, there are certain things that cannot touch you. Amen. There are certain things that cannot touch you. There are certain things that can do no harm to you. Why? Because you're going from faith to faith and from glory to glory. If you, if you believe that, say amen. amen. All right. Let's go to um, uh, the third reason why. The third reason why you must speak with other tongues is because mysteries are revealed. Mysteries are revealed. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7 says, Yet when I'm among many believers, I do speak with words of wisdom, but not the kind of wisdom that belongs to this world or of the rulers of this world, whom, uh, who are soon forgotten. So here he's saying, Paul is saying, when I'm speaking, I speak wisdom. But then he says, he makes a distinction. He's, here he says, I'm not speaking wisdom the way the world speaks of this wisdom. This wisdom does not come from man. This wisdom is not coming from my education, from my school, or from my college. None of those places. Look at verse 7. No, the wisdom we speak of is the mystery of God. Is the mystery of God. Then what he's saying is, when I speak, I speak the mysteries of God. The things that most people are concerned about, the things that most people have questions about. He says, when I open my mouth, I speak the mystery of God himself. Now how does he get to this place? He gets to this place because of him speaking with other tongues. Then he goes on to say, look at this. No, the wisdom we speak of is, the, is in the mystery of God. His plan that was previously hidden. 
His plan that was previously hidden. That means nobody else knew about this. That means he had the best teachers, but the teachers did not know about this mystery. Are you understanding that? Right? Then he goes on to say, even though he made it for our ultimate glory before the world began. He's speaking of the mystery of God, which was previously hidden. So the question is, where did he get this from? Where did he get this knowledge from? Where did he get this wisdom from? Now you can look back at the life of Paul and say, well, he went to the best teachers. He went to the best school. He, he, he was uh, brought up in one of the uh, most well-known families of that time and all of these things. Yeah, but think about what he said about all of those things. He said, I counted all of this as dung, he says. I count all of that as meaningless, he says. So obviously, that wisdom did not come from his natural education. However, what we see is, uh, after the, uh, the experience, the encounter that he has with Jesus on the road to Damascus, what happens? He gets saved. When, once his spiritual eyes are opened, once he begins to see the gospel, once he begins to see the revelation of who Christ is, then the Bible says he spends three years in Arabia. What's happening during that time? One of the things I want to submit to you, even though it is not explicitly said, is I believe during those three years, not only was he uh, 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 receiving things from God, he was receiving those things from God because he was praying in the Holy Spirit. Now you might say, but pastor, we don't see Paul being filled with the Holy Spirit. And yes, you're right. However, Every single time somebody got saved, the very next thing that I see is that they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak with other tongues. Are you understanding that? So there is no way Paul gets saved, has an encounter with Jesus himself, and then not be a person of prayer, and then not be a person that prays in the Holy Spirit. And as a result of praying in the Holy Spirit, he begins to get these mysteries. 1 Corinthians 14, 2 says this, For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the Spirit, everyone say in the Spirit. In the Spirit, he speaks mysteries. However, in the Spirit, he speaks mysteries. Verse 13 and 14 uh, of the same chapter. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. Verse 14. For I, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. Now, here's one of the things I want to encourage every one of you to do. And that is when you are praying in the Spirit, pray for interpretation. Pray for interpretation. Ask God for the interpretation of what you have prayed for. Now also, when, I'm, when we're talking about praying in the Spirit or speaking in tongues, I don't want this to be relegated only for the few minutes while you're in church or a few minutes at the end of the time of worship. This must become your lifestyle. Everyone say lifestyle. That means when you're going, when you're driving, you must be praying in the Holy Spirit. When you're working out, you can pray in the Holy Spirit. When you're uh, getting ready for your office, you can be praying in the Holy Spirit. When you're cooking, you can be praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, the, the way you keep doing that, the more you keep doing that, you're building yourself up, you're growing spiritually, and then you say, okay, Holy Spirit, what uh, uh, reveal to me, I need the interpretation of what I've prayed for. Now, the interpretation might come as a sentence for you at that time, or sometimes you believe that you receive the interpretation, and then when you go into the office, you will say exactly what needs to be said in that interview. You will say exactly what needs to be said when you're sitting with the CEO. You will say exactly what needs to be said when you're in that office meeting. Are you understanding that? You will, you will clearly understand. So interpretation, I don't want you to uh, simply relegate that to uh, somebody uh, speaks in a tongue, in a church service, and somebody else interprets what they said. That's not the, what I'm talking about. Today, especially what I'm talking about, is you praying in the Spirit for yourself. This is not about you prophesying over somebody's life. Even when, I'll, I'll get to this, even when it comes to the prophecy, it's about you prophesying about your own life. Are you understanding that? So when you're praying in the Spirit, you're building yourself up, and pray and ask God for the interpretation of what you have prayed. And as a result of that, when you go into certain situations, when you go into certain places, you're going there for the very first time. You don't know what to do. You don't know exactly how to uh, deal with the issues. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Pray in the Holy Spirit. 
For example, this last 10 days while I was in Japan, everything was new to me. That was the first time I'm in that nation. So every time I prepared, every time I needed to meet people, the thing that I was doing is I would pray in the Holy Spirit. 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 Why? Because as long as I'm praying in the Holy Spirit, I will do what needs to be done in that moment of time. Amen? All right. First Corinthians um, chapter 14. Let's go to verse 18, please. Verse 18. Here it says, I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than all of you. Yet in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may also teach, uh, sorry, yeah, that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. Now, in verse 18 here, he says, he prays more than others in tongues, all right? Which means, while he's praying in tongues, at the same time, mysteries are being revealed. That means he's being taught by God during that time. That means his eyes are able to see things that he could not see before. That means his ears are able to hear things that could not be heard before. That means his heart is able to perceive things that he could not perceive before. Why? Because when you are praying in the spirit, you're building your spirit man. Your spirit man is going higher and higher and higher. And so therefore, in verse 19, go to verse 19. Look at what he says. In, yeah, verse 19, here he says, um, Yet in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I, that I may teach others also. That I may teach others also. So here's what he's saying. So when I pray in the spirit, I'm speaking to God and I'm learning certain things, but then I will speak with my understanding. I will speak in English. I will speak in Telugu. I will speak in Tamil or Japanese. Why? So that I can teach what I have received. Are you understanding that? Now, what is being taught? What is he receiving? He is receiving mysteries that were previously hidden. Are you understanding that? That means, see, how many of you have had this experience where you open your Bible, you've read the same chapter multiple times, you've read that verse multiple times, and all of a sudden, one day you're reading the Bible and you see something that you did not see before. How many of you had that? All right. Or you've, you've read a certain scripture, you know the story a lot of times, and then all of a sudden you come to church one day uh, and you hear the pastor preaching and you're like, wait, how did I miss that? How did I not know that? Yeah, I, I know that story from childhood. I know that verse from childhood. I would have it in my bedroom. It was in our living room. In fact, I had it on my drawer. And, and yet, how did I miss that? I know that verse by heart, but I never saw it. I never heard these things. I never perceived that reality. How is that? It's by the work of the Holy Spirit. Everyone say the Holy Spirit. All right, number four, for giving thanks. Why must we pray in the Holy Spirit? To give thanks. Same chapter, chapter 14, verse 16 and 17 says this. For if you praise God only in the Spirit, how can those who don't understand you praise God along with you? How can those, how can they join you in giving thanks when they don't understand what you are saying? Verse 17, you will be giving thanks very well. But it won't strengthen the people who hear you. Now, understand he's writing in the context of a church. Okay? However, I am teaching to you not regarding the context of the church. I am teaching to you regarding your own personal life and context. Are you understanding that? Everyone understanding that? So look at what he says, verse 17. You will be doing what? You'll be doing what? When you're doing what? When you're speaking in tongues. So when you are speaking in tongues, what are you doing? Everyone loudly. You are? You are giving thanks. So again, if you only relegate speaking in tongues to church, you will miss out on a lot. But then if you are speaking in tongues while you're driving, while you're traveling, while you're cooking, while you're doing everything else in life, what are you doing? You are giving thanks. See, when you don't know, this is why, when you don't know what to pray, when you don't know how to pray, when you're in the hospital and the, teach, the doctors have given you a bad report, you're standing outside the ICU, when you're at the uh, uh, interview and it looks like you may not get the job, what do you do? How do you pray? You pray in the Spirit. 
And automatically, whether you know it or not, what he's saying is, you are giving thanks very well. That means this goes way beyond your natural understanding. So in spite of what is happening right there, you are speaking in tongues and you are giving thanks, you are giving glory, you are giving honor to God. Now, why is that so important, Pastor? Because I'm standing outside, my family member is in the ICU, why should I be giving thanks at that time? See, giving thanks is one of the most powerful keys in the new covenant. It's one of the most powerful keys in the new covenant, why? Because we receive everything from God as a gift. How do you receive a gift? By giving thanks. By giving thanks. So if you can understand having the attitude of thanksgiving, how many of you remember uh, the, the 10 lepers with Jesus? You remember that story? So the 10 lepers, he says, go show yourselves. And, and they go and all of them are healed, the Bible says. And how many return? One. And when that person returns, the thing that Jesus asked him, weren't there uh, 10? Weren't there 10? So what was he expecting? He was expecting them to come back and give thanks the way this one man came back and give, gave thanks. And one of the things that he says at the very end is, here he says, your faith has made you whole. If you go back to that verse, uh, 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 yeah, in, in the New King James, it says, he, uh, your faith has made you well. But if you go to the King James, it'll say, your faith has made you whole. If you actually go back to the Greek, the word comes from sozo. Another translation, I think it's the New Living Translation or uh, another translation says, your faith has saved you. Why? Sozo, salvation. It's the same root word that is used, which means... This one person got something that the nine did not get from Jesus. Are you, are you catching that? Are you understanding that? This one person got something that was beyond what the nine people got. And why did he get that? Why did he receive that? Is it because Jesus loved this man more than the rest? No. <laughs> no. It's not because Jesus loved him more. Jesus loved all of them. However, it was one man who came back and gave thanks. And when you give thanks, you automatically position yourself in a place of receiving from God. You position yourself in a place of receiving from God. Why? Because automatically, it, you know, speaking in tongues bypasses your human capacity. It bypasses your human understanding. So while you're standing outside the ICU, you begin to open your mouth and begin to speak with other tongues. You do not know. Your mind is unfruitful. Your mind does not know what you're saying. But in the spirit, you're thanksgiving, you, you're giving thanks unto God. Now, what are you giving thanks for? While you're praying in the spirit, you're not giving thanks that your family member is in the ICU. You are giving thanks for everything. Every good and perfect thing comes from God. You are giving thanks that every good and perfect thing that must be received is being received supernaturally by the help of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So one of the reasons or the fourth reason is for giving thanks. You must pray in the spirit. Number five. Let's go quickly. Number five is to pray the perfect will of God. To pray the perfect will of God. To pray the perfect will of God. Uh, this may be one of the most asked questions uh, uh, you know, as a pastor, you know, pastor, I'm trying to find out the will of God about my marriage. I'm trying to find out the will of God about uh, moving to another country. I'm trying to find the will of God regarding, uh, you know, where to buy the house, what job to take, and, and all of these questions. Will of God, will of God, will of God. Is this the will of God? Am, am I supposed to do this? Am I supposed, am I uh, not supposed to do this? This is a common theme and a common question that keeps coming up in the lives of many Christians. Well, one of the simplest things that you can do when you are not sure regarding the will of God God is to open your mouth and pray in the spirit. Open your mouth and pray in the spirit. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse 26. Are you learning something? All right. Romans chapter 8 and verse 26. Likewise, the spirit also helps in our weakness. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. Everyone say as we ought. That means there is a particular way to pray. What he's saying is there are times where I do not know how. I don't know the way I'm supposed to pray. And a lot of times we just think prayer is just simply saying, Oh God, do this for me. God, give me the seat. God, give me the visa. God, give me that girl. God, give me that guy. God, give me that job. It, well, well, prayer goes way beyond that. Now, it's okay for a child 
when, when you are born again, when you're just learning certain things of God, it's okay to deal that way. But however, as you're maturing in the things of God, you will understand there is a certain way you ought to pray. There is a certain way you approach the issues of life. There is a certain way you approach God himself. So here he says, but, uh, um, Romans 8 and verse 26, for we do not know what we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself, everyone say the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. With groanings that cannot be uttered. Verse 27. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the... According to the... Now, the same verse in the Amplified Classic, verse 27. Um, the, the last part of that verse says, because the spirit intercedes and pleads before God in behalf of the saints, according to and in harmony with God's will. According to and in harmony with God's will. So when you pray in the spirit, it is oftentimes called the perfect prayer. Why is it the perfect prayer? Because when you pray in the spirit, you are praying in line and in harmony and in accordance and in agreement with the will of, with the will of God, with the will of God. So when you are praying about your marriage, when you are praying about the job, when you are praying about the various things that are going on in your life, do I go here? Do I go there? Do I go up? Do I go down? Do I go forward? Do I go back? What am I supposed to do? I don't know. I'm confused and when you are confused, the best thing that you can do is open your mouth and pray in the spirit. Why? Because when you are praying in the spirit, you are praying in accordance, in line, in harmony with the perfect will of God. You will never pray the wrong prayer praying in the spirit. Hallelujah. You will never pray the wrong prayer praying in the spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is interceding. And when the Holy Spirit intercedes, he will always intercede and pray in line with the perfect will of God. So let me make it very practical, even for those of you who are getting ready to get married or even you're, you're not thinking about marriage right now. But here, here is the amazing thing. You know, you, you can be five years from your marriage, right? You might say, in the next five years, I'm going to get married. I'm going to get married in three years from now. I'm going to... and. and Every single time you pray in the Spirit, you may not know it and you may not even know it, but the Holy Spirit is preparing you for that marriage. The Holy Spirit is equipping you to say yes to the right person and no to the wrong person. No matter what kind of pressure you might have, whether it is age pressure, whether it is family pressure, whether it is societal pressure, whether it is, you know, oh, fr uh, all the friends keep saying that I should marry this guy. All my friends keep saying I should marry this girl. My parents want me to marry this, you know, whatever it is. In the midst of that pressure, you will know exactly who to say yes to and exactly who to say no to. Why? Because every single time you've spent time praying in the spirit, you were personally being strengthened. You were building yourself up. The building was going higher and higher and higher and higher. And you will get to the place where even if others do not see what you see, you will see what God is seeing. Why? Because you're in a higher place. And when that day comes, when you're seated face to face, when that picture is shown, whatever the case may be, you will say, yes, that's the right person. I want to meet them. Yes, that's the right person. I want to marry them. No, I know everything is right on paper. Yes, they have a good job, but I don't think I should go with them. I, I, I know everything is not right here, but I think this is the one I should go with. Why? Because you know things that other people do not know. Hallelujah. And you prepare your heart. You prepare yourself. I mean, even looking back at my own life, I believe this is one of the reasons why I made the right decision when it came to my marriage. There were a lot of issues that were a lot of challenges and there were a lot of pressure and all of these things happening during that time and that season of my life. But thanks be unto God. I cannot take credit for it. I cannot take not a single thing credit for it. But it is by the grace of God, by the help of the Holy Spirit, I said no to the wrong people and I said right to the right person. Hallelujah. So for every one of you who are in those kinds of situations, practice praying in the Holy Spirit. See, but if you neglect this, what will happen is, it's like, you know, uh, uh, you cramming for the exam the night before the exam. 
Are you understanding that? Oh, today I will pray for uh, uh, eight hours uh, uh, in the spirit. Why? Because in the morning we have to go and visit their family, pastor. That's not the right way to do it. Why? Because you're under pressure. You're under pressure. But if you keep doing it on a consistent basis, you build yourself up. Everyone say amen. All right. So the opposite is also true. Some of you are still making the wrong decisions because you do not pray in the spirit. You're coming to church. How, you know, you might be wondering, why is it that, you know, I, I keep making the wrong decisions? I'm coming to church, but why? You're coming to church, but the question is, are you building yourself up? You're coming to church, but I'm not there with you when you're making those decisions. You're coming to church, and, 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 and you know what the Bible says as well regarding not, not being uh, um, equally yoked with an unbeliever, and yet you will make the decision to marry an unbeliever, to get engaged to an unbeliever, to become a girlfriend of an unbeliever, to become a boyfriend of an unbeliever, and then what do you do? You try to start praying for them. The foundation is wrong. The foundation is wrong. And now you say, I, I, I don't know how to say no to them. You know why? Because you're weak. You're not strengthened. Are you understanding that? You're not strengthened. You're not strong enough. You're not able to, you're, 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 you've not built yourself high enough to see further. The higher you go, the further you can see. The more you're built up, the more stronger you are. You've got the ability to walk away from things. You've got the ability to say no to things. Hallelujah. Amen. All right, let's go to the, the next reason. To bring your tongue under subjection. To bring your tongue under subjection. To bring your tongue under subjection. James chapter 3, verses 6 through 8. It says, And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting the entire body. It can set your whole life on fire. How many of you know fire can be used for both good and bad? It can be used for your protection or it can completely destroy things, right? So here the Bible says, James is saying that your tongue, it can set your entire life on fire for it is set on fire by hell itself. Verse seven, people can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is relentless and evil, full of deadly poison. Now, and yet God chose to use your tongue to pray in the spirit. Death and life are in the power of the power of the tongue. Death and life. It's not only death. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Now, why is James only emphasizing the negative part? Because of the context of what he's talking about there. But that does not mean you cannot speak life. See, if you only read what, what is said here in verse um, uh, 7, here he says, people can tame all kinds of animals, but verse 8, but no one can tame the tongue. It is relentless and evil and full of deadly poison. And full of deadly poison. And by the way, let me, this is off topic, but I think it'll help. When it comes to how you read the Bible, if you do not have the help of the Holy Spirit, you're a lost person. I see so many internet professionals today who are so good with commenting by taking one script. See, I can take this scripture and say, the tongue is relentless and evil and full of deadly poison. Does the Bible say this? Come on, does the Bible say this? You can clearly see it. But is that the whole truth? Are you understanding that? So just because a sentence is written in the Bible does not mean that's the whole truth. You must understand the context in which it is being written. So here James is saying, the, the, he's literally saying the tongue is relentless and evil, full of deadly poison. Now, if something is full of deadly poison, can something else fit in there? No. However, the reason he's saying that is because he's trying to get a point across. And yet the same Bible will say, death and life are in the power of the tongue. 
not just death, death and life. So when, when James is saying nobody can rule it, that's not truth. In your own strength, yes, you cannot rule it. However, you're not left alone. You have the Holy Spirit. Everyone say the Holy Spirit. So when I'm speaking in other tongues, I'm not speaking death. I'm not spewing death. I'm not full of deadly poison. My tongue is not full of deadly poison. When I am speaking in the spirit, I am speaking life. Everyone say life. And this is the reason why you, the, 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 the eyes of your understanding must be opened by the Holy Spirit. And that's why even when you're reading scripture, you don't just take one verse and then say, oh, see what the Bible says? So our, our tongues are completely deadly poison. There can nothing good can come out of our mouth. No, that is not true. There's a lot of good that can come out of our mouths. If this was absolute truth, then everything that Jesus ever spoke is deadly poison. Everything Paul that ever spoke was deadly poison. Forget all of that. That means even what James spoke is deadly poison. And that's not true. I said, that's not true. So death and life are in the power of the tongue. And that's why Jesus said also, they, are, they will be justified by the words that come out of their mouth and they will be condemned by the words that come out of, your, of their mouth. So the more you begin to pray in the spirit, what happens? You will begin to control and tame your tongue. See, the fruit of the spirit is self-control. So the more you pray in the spirit, what happens? The more you will begin to develop self-control. You've already got self-control on the inside of you. Why? Because it is the fruit of the spirit. It's the fruit of the spirit. And so you've got self-control, but the more you begin to pray in the spirit, what happens? You develop that muscle even stronger and the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of self-control will become more evident in your life. If you understand that, say amen. All right. So number six, it brings your tongue under subjection or under control. Verse seven. Uh, not verse seven. Seventh reason, all right? Consciousness of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit or consciousness of God inside you, right? Consciousness of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit or the consciousness of God in you, of God in you. Why must I pray in the Holy Spirit? Why must I speak with other tongues? It is because you will become more conscious of the God that is on the inside of you. You will become more conscious of the God that is on the inside of you. Now, a lot of times what happens is with the Christian life, we, we come to church or, uh, you know, we hear a sermon, we pray and we do all of those things in church. But once we walk out, we many times people lose consciousness of the fact that God is with them and in them. Are you understanding that? But the more you begin to pray in the spirit, the more conscience you conscious you will be about the person of the Holy Spirit dwelling on the inside of you. Everyone say God in me. Now, when we say God in me, it is not some kind of, uh, uh, you know, we are all God and the universe is God. I am God. We are all one. That's not what I'm talking about. The reason why you can say God in you is only because you're a new creation. If you are not a new creation, you've got no God on the inside of you. Is that very clear? It is only the new creation that can truly say and truthfully say that I have God on the inside of me. Why? Because I made a new creation and now the Holy Spirit resides on the inside of me. If you understand that, say amen. All right, John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. And I will pray that the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. And everyone say in me. So this is Jesus talking. And Jesus, when he's talking to the disciples here, he says, for he dwells with you. He dwells with you. He's with you. He's working with you. When you do the miracles, he's working with you. He dwells with you. However, he says, and will be in you. 
When did he get on the inside of them? When they were baptized with the Holy Spirit in the upper room. 120 staying there, waiting on the Holy Spirit. And when they were baptized with the Holy Spirit, they were filled. The Holy Spirit moved on the inside of them. Everyone say, inside me. Inside me. God in me. The Bible says, Christ in me, the hope of glory. See, that's why once you become uh, 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 accustomed to this reality, once you begin to understand this is the life, this is the abundant life Christ came to give me. The abundant life that Christ came to give me is that God now resides on the inside of me. That I'm one with God. Christ in me. Christ in me and I in Christ. What are we talking about? We're talking about a union with God. And the more you pray in the spirit, what happens? The more you're conscious of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Now I want you to just ask yourself the question. How does your life change when you become conscious that God is in you? Not just with you. That God is in you. How does that change your confidence tomorrow morning? When you have to go to that bank, how does that change your confidence? When you have to go to that interview, how does that change your confidence? When you have to pray for the sick, how does that change your confidence? When you have to share your testimony or share the gospel with a neighbor or co-worker or somebody else, how does that change your boldness? That you're not going there in your own strength and ability. You're not saying things by yourself, but it is the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. He's going to help you. He's going to give you the right words. And you are going to do what needs to be done in that area. Why? Because you're conscious of the fact that the Holy Spirit resides on the inside of you. How does that change your behavior? Now, every single one of us, don't, don't, doesn't our behavior change based on who's in the room? Yes or no? No, it's not always a bad thing. I'm not saying like you were sitting horribly and I walk in and it's like, oh, I don't know anything. No, it's, it's even small things like you're, you're, you're not doing anything bad. However, when certain people come, you quickly stand up. Not because you were doing something sinful by sitting down. Just because of the fact of who is there, you show a sign of respect. You stand up. You greet the person. Good morning, sir. Good morning, ma'am. How are you doing? You give them a chair. Even if there were no chairs, you get up, you give your chair to them. Why? Because you are conscious of whose presence you walked into or whose presence you are in. Your behavior changes. You're conscious. That means the way you treat other people will change. Why? You've got the Holy Spirit residing on the inside of you. How do you mistreat person when God is on the inside of you? How do you mistreat your co-worker when you know God is with you? How do you say the wrong things when the Holy One is on the inside of you? See, the more you pray in the Spirit, the more conscious you are of His presence. Now, you don't have to raise your hands for this, but the reality is if I say, how many of you really on a daily basis are conscious of the Holy Spirit, very few hands will go up. As Christians, I, I know majority of people have gone days without thinking about the Holy Spirit, weeks without thinking about the Holy Spirit, months thinking without thinking about the Holy Spirit. In some cases, maybe even years without thinking about the Holy Spirit. And yet he is the one who worked on you. He is the one who, that, who brought you to the point of salvation. And he's the one who's constantly working in, on the inside of you, working in you and working through you. Hallelujah. The person of the Holy Spirit. Why do we pray in tongues? Why do we speak in tongues? I've given you seven reasons so far today. And I pray that this will help you shift your way of thinking regarding the Holy Spirit. And even in regards to speaking in other tongues, 
that you will not see it as oh that's only for the few people oh that's just a you know pentecostal thing that's just only a charismatic thing we you know we come from a different denomination we don't do that we don't believe in that the only question is this does your denomination have the same bible end of story end of story this is not a charismatic bible it's not a pentecostal bible it's only one holy bible that's all come on let's stand to our feet i'm so glad what god is doing in our church even the last two sundays and then the women's revival meetings that took place i know a multitude of you have begun to speak with other tongues for the very first time but i don't want it to be a just a sunday morning thing don't want it to be a sunday morning thing i want it to be your lifestyle as a pastor my desire is that every one of you pray in the spirit every day every day that you don't go a few hours without praying in the holy spirit that you're, you're so conscious and that sometimes it just comes out of you it just comes out of you you just that that that, that spirit of thanksgiving the joy the peace the gentleness the kindness the fruit of the spirit will be so evident in your life why because you pray in the holy spirit yes you take time uh, to to uh, to go in your closet and pray but also make it a lifestyle see sometimes when you're driving what do you do you just call the person you call your spouse you call your son you call your daughter you call your parent you call your friend what well, you don't say well i'm driving so i'm not going to talk You don't say I'm cooking so I'm not going to talk. What do you do? While you're driving, while you're going in the train, while you're traveling in the bus, you're talking. What are you doing? You're conscious of that person. You're developing that relationship. That's all I'm saying. That's all, that's all I want you into the habit of it. Maybe even keep a reminder on your phone that every 3 hours you'll just get a reminder. Hey, talk to the Holy Spirit. Speak in tongues. Hey, speak in tongues. every 3 hours just and it can be 2 minutes you might be in the middle of a meeting and you're you're walking from your cubicle to somebody else's cubicle and you it's in the middle of the work day so it's not like you'll spend 30 minutes with worship music and praying in the spirit but just you're walking from your cubicle to somebody else's cubicle and you say so branda le brosi ti kiri mandere brosi kere le mande lora man bro no ro kri brasi kele ba bro to ro mande and while you're going there you are expecting to say exactly what needs to be said when you go to that cubicle exactly what needs to be said when you go there all of a sudden the ceo calls some department head calls and and you don't know why they're calling you you pray so blem branda ra kono basi kere manda lo bresi ti kere mande the favor of god is upon me the favor of god goes before me everything is made perfect everything is made right for me le branda na kara bara so kara bala varianda ro bre ti mangre so kara mande le branda na kara bo so to ro lo mangre kire basi ti kere ande ri kara ra la mande and you come to the room and you say and you come to the door and you say god i thank you i receive the interpretation of that and I receive that in my life in Jesus name you open the door and you say hello sir how are you doing and you walk you sit you have the meeting amen you walk into your college pray in the spirit and you walk into that college you walk into your apartment pray in the spirit and walk every meeting pray in the spirit pray in the spirit now some of you might say pastor i've not been filled with the holy spirit well luke chapter 11 i'll read it to you verse 11 through 13 If a son asks for bread from any father among you will he give him a stone or if he asks for a fish will he give him a serpent instead of a fish or if he asks for an egg will he give him a scorpion if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children how much more your heavenly father gives you the holy spirit to those who ask him to those who ask him now everybody lift your hands to heaven For the next 5 minutes we're going to pray and then for the next 5 minutes I want you to speak with other tongues. Say heavenly father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for the Holy Spirit. I'm asking you fill me with the Holy Spirit. I want to be baptized with the Holy Spirit and speak with other tongues. I receive it 
now in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, open your mouth and begin to pray in other tongues. Be filled with the Spirit of God right now. Every person that did not pray in tongues before, open your mouth and begin to pray. Lift your hands to heaven. Be in a point of receiving from God. Lift your hands to heaven in reverence. And now, open your mouth and speak. 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 Le brondo non gresi kala babro tora man le bratire ma. No baranda le kara babro ste kerere le mande. Re blo branda ro kara ma so koro babratiki. Le baranda ne brongle ra ba so toro mande le kara baba si kere mande. Re bro la man branda re ingreso kara mande le kara ma ta kara ma so koro mande. Re bara ba mando ro bre bla bra so koro mande. Iri anda langreso koro mande. Le baranda ne brondo longresa kara mande. Re bara mando Rongle broto rama se kere rele mande, rara mando lo bre se kere mando ro kana na ma se kere mande, ri brondo lo bra se kere rele mande le kara la ba broso koro mande. Ire mando rombre se kare rele ma baranda ro kara la marava so koro mande ne bara mando rombre bronda re bro se kire rele mande ne kere ba bro to ro ma se kere mande le bronda no gre si kara la mande ne kara la ma bronda ro kara ma se kere rele mande ri ba mangre so koro mande le bra se kere rele mande e bronda ram bra so koro ro la ma bra ta ra ma so koro mande ri kere rele mande hallelujah 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 Heavenly Father, we receive everything that we've prayed for. We believe, Father. We thank you that we prayed the perfect will Father, uh, uh, that you have for us. We receive wisdom. We receive revelation. We receive favor. We receive impartation. We receive all that must be received from you, Lord. We give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for it. Lord, I pray for every person under the sound of my voice that throughout this week, Lord, that they will continue to spend time in your presence throughout this week, that they will pray in the holy spirit and may signs wonders and miracles be their portion in jesus mighty name we pray and everyone said amen and amen hallelujah i hope you were blessed by the word today be sure to subscribe and share this with your family and friends if you would like to sow into this ministry the details are provided in the description for more information on how to reach us or contact us do visit our website www.newcityhyd.in I will see you again next time. Be blessed.